Our children suffer from a condition. They have been born with a condition called pneumolian myopathy. It's a genetic condition which they have inherited at birth. They were born in Uttarakhand before they came into our lives around 2014. There was an absence of knowledge about myopathy. Absence of knowledge among doctors, amongst caregivers, and certainly complete absence of knowledge on the part of their parents. And of course, everyone lives in a sense, in a feeling of self-denial. The families where the children are born feel that, well, there's nothing wrong with them. There were no testing facilities, even in major institutes in India. And where there were testing facilities, such as, as the Postgraduate Institute in Lucknow, we were told that the test then was so invasive and so painful that they would remove a part of the tissue from the child without anesthesia. It was so terribly painful. And I still remember the time when the test was done. The test had to be done for both the children. And after the older child underwent the test, all that she could say in that sense of pain and suffering for the test, was she said, don't allow my sister to go through this, please. So there was an absence of adequate testing, absence of schools in Uttarakhand. When the child, when the children came to us in Allahabad, the sole school which was run by the good Mr. Banerjee for children with disabilities had shut down because Mr. Banerjee was no more. And there was no school where the children could even learn the basics of alphabet or everything that a little child aspires for. But the children would always have little school bags at home with a snack box and their bottle of water because that represented their, their feelings. They, they, they aspired to go to school. So they would play school with their own little bags at home. But when we moved to Delhi, we found a school for them, which was Tamanna, run by the redoubtable Dr. Chona. And she said that, you know, this is not a school for these children. These are, this is a school for children suffering from predominantly autism. But these children are fine because they have a genetic condition, but they are mentally as razor sharp as any other child. And gradually, she said, we have to mainstream these children, which is what we did. Now, they went to a, we were thinking of sending them to a good school. So we went to various schools. And the first question that we asked was, how will the other children treat these children in school? And does the school have any sense of policy to ensure that these children are not bullied, that these children are not disparaged? Because that would really set them back. And the principals of so many schools told us that, well, children are children. So they'll have to survive amongst other children. Until we found Sanskriti and they said that we have, we have mentor children, we have friends who will be associated with these children to ensure that other children learn how to deal with them. Another problem which so many of these children with disability face in school is that when you mainstream these children, because they are capable of being mainstreamed, you realize that there are very few facilities to accommodate the real needs of children. So if a child is fond of science, and the science lab is in a basement, the child can't go to the science lab for the simple reason that there is no ramp and there is no lift. So a child has to sit in class when everybody else goes to a science lab, though science is so close to that child's heart. Or, when all the other children go to the playground, that child can't go to the playground because once you're out, it takes such a Herculean effort to come back to class. All other children participate in dramatics. All other children participate in poetry or debates. But children who have a speech defect, as all children with muscular disorders do, 
they are not allowed to participate in dramatics because of the fear that the audience may not have the patience or the tolerance to give that child another two minutes to explain what that child has to say. So these are some of the problems which good institutions face even today in capital cities like, like Delhi. What about gene therapy? Gene therapy is really at the cutting edge of knowledge today. I was at a conference on gene therapy in Bangalore last weekend, again for a reason very close to my heart. Now gene therapy costs between 7 crores to 30 crores for one single dose today. Who can afford it? But there is reason for hope because countries like India are now taking steps forward to provide for accessible medicine and accessible treatment. But that has to be part of a national policy guided and supported by the government. Policies cannot be only for the mainstream because these children are capable of the very best because they have minds of their own, they have individualities of their own, they have a volition of their own. I still remember that during COVID times, I hope I'm not taking too much of your time and I'll keep to my time and then cut short my written text. During COVID times when schools were online, our little Mahi, who was then just about nine, suddenly heard the noise of a woodcutter, an electric woodcutter, and she tells the teacher, can we please, can I please break from the class for a minute because I think someone is cutting a tree in our garden. So the teacher says, yes, of course, you can leave the class for a couple of minutes, but be sure to be back. So she goes into the garden and of course, lo and behold, you have the horticulture department trying to prune the trees as they normally do to make them look more attractive. And she runs into them on her wheelchair and says, you dare not touch any of these trees because these trees are homes, they are nests, and they are the homes for our birds who come here. And if you cut these trees, the birds will have no place to, to survive. What I want to emphasize is that there is a great deal of transformative potential in children suffering from disabilities. They are not just children who are in need of care and protection, but they have within themselves the ability to transform others as my contact, not only with Priyanka and Mahi, but with other people from suffering from disabilities who uh, I've been able to interact with, who've transformed our lives and our institution. And I'll give you a few examples just in a moment. Mahi in particular is a fierce environmentalist and she believes in following a cruelty-free lifestyle. She's mother to eight cats, and she single-handedly delivered a litter of five when her favorite cat gave birth to a five-litter kitten just about two months ago in the middle of the night. But she, in the course of following a cruelty-free lifestyle, had been telling us for the last 10 years that please adopt a cruelty-free lifestyle. It took 10 years for me to be persuaded. Judges sometimes take a very long time to be persuaded, <laughs> including in the court at home. But they were the reason why I switched to veganism. Because veganism is not just about being a vegetarian and excluding dairy and honey from your diet. It's also about following a lifestyle which does not accept cruelty. And therefore, she has persuaded us into adopting a lifestyle, not just in terms of nutrition, but in terms of practicing a cruelty-free approach to life in general and to every living creature. I think we have to recognize the autonomy and the agency of every child. Too very often when we mainstream our policy approaches to disability, we tend to believe that we are in a parent's patria jurisdiction for young children with disabilities. Well, of course, they need robust policy making, but they also need policy making which is conversant with what they desire out of life. And I think that's something which we cannot ignore. We must also understand that disabilities, particularly disabilities originating in genes such as sickle cell anemia in our country, 
have a particular degree of prevalence among tribal groups, among the more marginalized citizens. And therefore, we cannot really look upon, you know, treating these disorders as merely a function of how much of a population group are we going to improve in terms of the quality of their lives. The reason why we have to go in with policy interventions is because they represent truly specific marginalized groups in our society who are in need of care and protection. But I'd like to, before I make a more formal presentation, I'd like to only share two more, uh, two more examples. I can talk about my children for the rest of the day, but that's not the purpose of this conference. But I want to share with you two of my own associations. One of the speakers who's going to talk to you is Rahul Bajaj, who's a Rhodes Scholar. And Rahul wrote to me a couple of years ago and said that I want to come back to Delhi and intern with you. And I said, why on earth would somebody want to give up the rest of a Rhodes Scholarship and come to work with a judge of the Supreme Court? I mean, go ahead and finish your PhD. So he said, no, I have something better in mind for my future. And so he came and worked with me. But he said, before I start working with you, I interned with Justice Lalit, and I realized in that short internship that there's so much that you have to do in the Supreme Court to make that workplace a barrier-free workplace for me. So I said, well, we'll try and do that. There's so much that a judge can do with a chief justice can do much more because, you know, you can change policies. But even when I was a judge of the Supreme Court at that point of time, before my assuming office as chief justice, that really set us into making small and incremental changes in the way we work in the Supreme Court. Digitizing files, making those files compatible with screen reader access, OCR-enabled files. Files, uh, the website of the Supreme Court had a visual capture. So something as simple as altering a visual capture into a verbal capture makes a difference on whether someone with visual disabilities can access all the information which the Supreme Court provides. So in the course of our association, with someone who was there to learn, I think we learned so much more. And our institutions get transformed. We have Sara Suni here, and she appeared in our court a few months ago, and we realized that we had no sign language interpreting facilities in the Supreme Court. Now, how does a young lawyer who has a particular condition live with dignity and conduct her profession with dignity unless we create those conditions. And we can't look at that as a function of how much would be the budget impact, budgetary impact, because it's all about the nature of the society which we wish to create in future. Do we truly aspire to have an integrated, inclusive society? And if we do, I think there is so much that our society has to do and learn in terms of the aspirations of those who suffer from conditions of disability. And the last thing, we, then I'll briefly make my formal presentation. Yesterday in our court, we had uh, someone on a wheelchair. And uh, she was really assisting the court in a very important aspect of uh, disability rights. And after the arguments were over and she was about to leave the court, I said, uh, I asked her, ma'am, what was your experience about navigating the space of the Supreme Court before you came into the court? So she said, well, I'm extremely happy because we have an accessibility desk. I was guided into where I should go. Uh, I didn't have any problem. But she says, I have one problem. Uh, and that is, your courts are so overcrowded. So I said that, you know, there's so much that judges can do, but I don't think I can do much about the population coming into the open court. 